put off by how long this video is, don't worry. I tend to jam-pack my videos with as much content, as many details as I possibly can, and I try to talk pretty fast. So while the video is a bit on the long side, I don't repeat myself and I get into a lot of details about the subject that, you know, pretty much anything that I feel I can comment on and that I think you might find interesting. But hey, if the video is just too long for you to watch, chances are I recorded a shorter version and the link will be in the description box. It's not an inferior video, it's merely a Cliff's Notes version of this very video. Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers, movie review. The Fellowship has split into three groups, and while I'm not sure I should really give away what exactly two of these groups will be doing, the third one consists of Sam and Frodo still on the way to Mordor, and they realized that maybe it wasn't a completely brilliant idea to split off from the rest of the group and proceed on to Mordor by themselves, because as Frodo put it in the last movie, I will go there, though I do not know the way. Yeah, fortunately, they meet up with Gollum, who agrees to take them to the gates of Mordor. But they do know what Gollum has been through, and they know of his desire for the ring. So it's a shaky alliance, to say the least. And in the... other than this continued quest, with the ring, the alliance between Sauron and Saruman winds up for all-out war against the world of man. This is a fantastic middle portion to the trilogy. I should maybe really quickly again state I'm not really a fan of fantasy, I have not read the books, I've just done research. This is my second viewing of the trilogy, and I come at it as a fan of great filmmaking and someone who's into mythology. I can enjoy stuff that is supernatural as long as it's actually delving into something interesting, going into themes like this trilogy is. This does have some problems associated with being the middle chapter. For one thing, there's not that much of a distinct beginning or end. And I should also point out, it very much assumes you saw the first one. Nothing is re-explained or re-established. And it, it's... I would actually say, the way it plays, you can very easily marathon at least these first two movies, I, as far as I recall, also the, yeah, the entire trilogy, and it wouldn't feel like odd. Like, if you marathon, you know, uh, a television series, you're gonna have to sit through that freaking, you know, intro sequence every single time with the, the opening credits and everything. Not really so here. It goes right into it, and yeah, in fact, the the very first scene contains a pretty major spoiler for the first one, so, yeah. And yes, I realize I've also in my plot outline spoiled things from the first one. Again, if you gotta start with the first one, there's just no, you're not gonna get anything out of this trilogy if you don't watch it right from the first. And that actually brings me nicely into this one has a much faster pace than the first one, thankfully. The first one really introduces and establishes the world, the characters, these different races. This does not spend a lot of time introducing. There's, there's really not very much new to introduce. There are a few new characters and one or two areas. There's, there's some marshland, which is pretty memorable. It's, it's a good scene, anyway. And with 
nothing particularly left to introduce, it instead, yeah, can, can really get moving, can get to some plot, and yeah, it's, it's a very tense film. The first one got really tense at points, this one is tense almost from start to finish. It's like 165 minutes, not counting the end credits, and it really is, it, it starts tense and ends tense. There's, you know, it starts with reminding you of something really cool from the first one and ends on something that is really going to ensure that you watch the third one. Yeah. I'm not going to be giving anything away about that, don't worry, not in this video. And, yeah, so with this one, it's, it's really just tense from start to finish. As I said, the fellowship is split into three groups and it cuts back and forth between the different ones. And the tendency is that it cuts away from a group right when you really want to see what's going to happen to that group in the next couple of seconds. And then it cuts back to them later to show yeah, what happened, and yeah, it just, you really, you just do not stop watching the screen for a second. It's, it's really exciting. I'm not sure there's much more action technically, but some of the action is definitely bigger, and the climax of this movie is amazing. It's one of the hugest battles I've ever seen depicted on film, and it's, highly memorable. Again, the action is these, you know, the various fights, and it's fast and well choreographed, keeping a very nice balance between being chaotic and allowing you to keep up with what's going on, to the point where you won't really wonder, you know, it's, it's very easy to keep track of the order of things that happen as you watch the action scene. But it's also so fast that after the action scene is done, you probably won't remember every single detail. And to the point where it's also, it's very rewatchable. You're going to notice, you know, new details to the fights and such. Because they're, they're huge. And they really do feel, like I said, they get huge at times. And there is really a very palpable sense of importance of finality to it, where it, yeah, you really don't underestimate how important it is that the good guys win this time around. Now, there, th this one fixes most of the very few complaints there were about the first. It doesn't have a lot of exposition, and even when there is, it tends not to feel like forced or just said for the audience's benefit. To be fair, actually, this one almost goes a little too far away. There were a couple of times where I really, again, not having read the books, but having done research, I wasn't entirely clear on why something was happening or what exactly, but yeah. Now, the... The comic relief is much more restrained, and most of the haha, he's short jokes have been moved onto the dwarf instead of the hobbits. The hobbits are barely comic relief in this one, which I'm very, very grateful for. And they actually have something to do, which is very nice. And Elijah Wood gets to act, and not just act terrified. But, but yeah, it's a much darker film, excuse me, and again, it, it really takes advantage of all that the first one did and was. The first one was a lighter film, it took its time, it got you accustomed to this world. This just, you know, hits the ground running, just never stops, because you already know the various races involved, the various characters. It, it just broadens what we already know. The, the, there are various interesting themes, again, friendship, hope, 
love, loss, sacrifice, and the ring continues to be very a very corrupting presence, although it's not as much of a focus in this as it was in the first. But again, the way to watch these is to obviously watch them in order, and the first really establishes that. But there is a lot of tension surrounding the ring in this one. And the the, the character of Gollum is one of the best things about this film and about this entire franchise. He is so complex. There is so much to the the character. I'll I, I should talk a little bit about how they created the character as well, because that is very worth noting. In what I believe is pretty much a first, they pretty well just took everything that the actor Andy Serkis did, who later went on to play, I believe, King Kong and also Peter Jackson, so as you can tell, he was very impressed with the circus. And yeah, they, they had him in a motion capture suit, and they. Th the actual Gollum in the film is a CGI creation, but they use his facial expressions in addition to his voice and his movements a lot of the time. There are a few times where he's fully animated, but it really is mostly his performance. And this is where it really is, that's one of the negatives to using CGI and going all CGI, is you lose a lot of the humanity, a lot of the sort of personal creativity. Film is a production of a lot of people, it is the, the cumulative efforts of a lot of people, sometimes thousands of people. And it's a real shame to lose an actor in a CGI character to have it just entirely be decided by the computer and or the animator. No disrespect meant to animators, but they... Yeah, the, the actor is who should really be performing a character, and here they do bring that back in without having an actual actor do the physical part, because he's really... he's very skinny. He actually looks like... Yeah, in, in the review of the first I mentioned, it's it has sort of an... Uh, yeah, maybe I shouldn't give that away, actually, come, come to think of it. In, anyway, yeah, he's, he's very skinny and very worn down, and getting back to the, the character. And basically, he's, he's gone very primal, as we're told in the first, and again, this is... Not a spoiler, it's told in the first few minutes of the first movie. He has been away from his kind for a very long time. He used to be not too different from a hobbit, but now he he's almost unrecognizable as he's he's very inhuman, if you'll pardon the phrase. Un Hobbit. He's very in Hobbit. And or in, in Riverfolk. Anyway, he's, he's very primal, he has this sort of grunty voice where it's, it's almost like a caveman. He's, he's regressed, kind of, having not been around others. And he's also, he, yeah, he has various really unpleasant habits that I'm not gonna give away here. And you have to really wonder about him. Is he beyond saving? And the... You know, because you, you know what has happened to him and you can kind of understand. So you, you feel a certain amount of sympathy for him. And I will definitely say the ring continues to corrupt and to change others. And that's all I'll say about that. The 
returning to the effects, the they, they remain a great blend of CGI and practical effects, with animatronics, great makeup and prosthetics. The the orcs and Urukai still look great, really, really monstrous, and with a lot of expression to mouths and eyes and the like. They really feel like... You, you never feel like you're watching a person in a suit or a mask or anything like that. There isn't... I, I can't think of anything you look at in this movie and you're like, well, that's fake. Not... not really. There, there are a couple of things where you can kind of figure out, well, that was probably CGI, but it, the, the effects... You know, the, the progress in the technology had gotten so far, even between the first one and this, that it's seamless. You, it's the, the integration between live action and CGI elements is pretty well seamless. Now, the... The, the pacifism, anti-industrialism, and environmentalism is more present in this than it was in the first, with, uh, you know, pacifism very represented in that war is kind of seen by the good guys as a last resort. You will, you may have to defend yourself, but you, you know, you don't seek out war. You don't want war. And I find that the film does a fantastic job of really downright evoking, you know, anti-war films. I mean, we're talking in all quite on the Western Front levels of just really making you care about these these characters and their their families, the, the families of the warriors where you you see how it hits. You see these... Yeah, the, the family members just terrified at the prospect of losing one of their own to a war. And it's, it's very, very powerful. And the anti-industrialism... It's pretty well directly said that Saruman is like... Industrial, is like he no longer cares for nature and for what's alive. He is all about this machine of steel and fire or something like that. So yeah, not so subtle dig at industrialism and the environmentalism. I really appreciate and agree with this theme. I do, however, very much wish that they had thought of a less silly way to treat it than to have straight up talking trees. Yeah. And I'd especially appreciate it if the trees didn't talk even slower than I do and, you know, go off on almost as many tangents as I do. I think I'm about to reach my quotient of self-deprecation, at least for this video. Now, the... The humor in this, it, we still do have some comic relief. As I said, it's more about the dwarf this time, very much focused on his height, and also some of his pride, his competitiveness, which I neglected to mention in the first one, the review of the first one. And there's actually a kind of fun thing in this where basically he and Legolas are, the, the elven archer, are competing over who takes out the most of the enemies. And yeah, it's it's a fun little and it, it helps break the the tension and the darkness of what's going on around them. Again, very, very dark film. Dark tone, dark lighting. Yeah, you, you really feel like it is heading towards a dark place, a, and a very unpleasant place, and yeah, you, you really appreciate all the, the, the light material of the first one, all the 
escapism almost of that movie where this really just brings you face to face with yeah some some of the most unpleasant truths about history and war and the like excuse me now the dialogue remains old english without being impossible to follow without notes we still have an ensemble cast with a few new joining, such as Carl Urban and people I don't know the names of. David Wenham also. And again, mostly appropriately cast and all of them doing really well. We have gorgeous New Zealand locations. Again, fewer than the first. And the scope gets bigger than it was in the first, we really feel like it is it, it is coming to be a genuine world war of fantasy, in, in a world of fantasy. And that really comes across. There, there are a lot of movies that try to be really big in sort of the scope of battles and the like. Few succeed like this does. Now, there is again a nice, nice nuance to it with, you know, the, basically someone can make a mistake without being a bad guy and various, I'd say especially in the character of Gollum, again, is where the nuance is and you feel like, yeah, some, someone can do wrong without outright being evil, and it's a really nice alternative to the orcs, who are just plain evil throughout, through and through. Now, that might more or less cover it. Yeah, if at all you enjoyed the first one, you pretty much have to proceed on to this one. And again, if you haven't watched the first one, yeah, I know these three movies are like three hours a piece, but you really do not want to skip one. You'll, you won't have a clue what is going on. I've reviewed other parts of this series. The links are in the description box. Please rate and comment, and hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.